Well, good morning, everyone. Unfortunately, we are still meeting online. I don't know if we call it meeting, but we get to still continue preaching God's word, listening to God's word, uh, praying. And so we're going to start this morning by again opening up our Bibles and we're going to start reading through the letter of Colossians. So I hope you're turning right now to the letter of Colossians. And we'll be reading the first 23 verses this morning. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to, pray, to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving, thank, giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now... He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which our poor have become a servant." Just so far in the Lord's word this morning. 
Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We give you joyful thanks this morning for qualifying us to share in the inheritance of the saints. It's you who have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and have brought us into the kingdom of your Son. In your Son, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And it's your Son who is the image of God, who has made all things, and he is before all things. We know that he is the head of the church and has supremacy over everything. And in him, all things have been reconciled. He has made peace by the shedding of his blood on the cross. And so now we praise you, our Father, who is infinite in power and has unfailing love and who has given us your Son. We thank you and praise you for this this morning. And we would pray that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. We would pray that your kingdom will come in our own lives. May you, O oh God, fill us this morning with the knowledge of your will and understanding. Do this so that we might be able to live a life worthy of you, helping us to bear fruit. Also, Father, will you strengthen us? Strengthen us so that we might have endurance and patience and to give you joyful thanks. We also now pray that your kingdom come in our church. We thank you, Father, for the Beacon Baptist Church. We thank you for every member and adherent of this church. And we thank you for the display of faith in Jesus Christ and the display of the love for one another and for the hope that is set on heaven, all which has spr sprung forth from the gospel. And now we also thank you for our pastors. We thank you for Mark and Michael and for Neil and Brian and for Ron. We thank you that just like Epaphras in, Coloss in Colossae, who was a faithful servant of Christ, who taught the gospel, and we thank you for these men who do that for us. And we now pray that, that, we pray that you uplift them this morning. We pray you continue to keep them fresh in you, continue to find joy in you, continue to serve us with endurance and love. We also thank you this morning for our missionaries and outreach ministries. We know COVID-19 has brought challenges, has disrupted many ministry opportunities, and as well as affecting the pockets of the missionaries, because we know that the, lock, the economy is being affected. And so we will pray that you continue to provide for each one, give wisdom to each and creativity in order to find ways to continue ministering the gospel. And we pray that you would give them perseverance and that they too would continue to find joy in their Lord and Savior. And so we think now of those serving among the Amazioni. We think of Ron. We thank you for the service that he has given. We pray you continue to uplift him and we we thank you how you are with them, with Gail in this difficult time going through cancer. And we continue to pray for them, that you would be close to them and that you would continue to heal Gail. We think of the Khursans. We pray that you will continue to use Luan and Suz Suzanne as they continue to minister. And we think of the Atkins in PE. We pray that... Barry will be able to continue recovering from the shoulder up. We continue to pray for Nathan. Um, and we know that yeah, he's got to go to the dentist and, and has problems with, with his teeth. We pray that you would, would help them. And we also thank you for the good news about Peter Jade. We thank you to see how you're working in her life and that. You are, you are, and this is bringing much joy to the Atkins family, and so we thank you for that. We think of the Mullahs in Malawi. Wow, how, how faithful they have been over 20 years in ministry in Malawi. 
And so we continue, you pray, we, we pray you continue to give them endurance. We also pray for Christine as she continues to mourn the loss of her father, especially being, you know, yeah, especially being difficult at this time just to be away from family. And so we pray you continue to comfort her and the family in this very difficult time. We think of the Mayrings in Japan. We pray that you would give them perseverance and encouragement. And as they confess, it's been very difficult to be away from family, especially now over Christmas. And so we think of them and they pray for the salvation of three contacts with their family. Um, and so we pray that you would bring these people, show the gospel to them. May they see the light of Christ. And we also pray for their financial support that's being affected during COVID-19. We think of the Duns. Up in America, who are train, who are being, where John is being trained for aviation ministry. We thank you for them. And we, we even thank you that for the their birth of their daughter this year. And we pray you continue to um, bless them, continue to help, especially Tanya as she raises a newborn while homeschooling her, the other two children. That's a very tough task, and so we ask you for, their, for your blessing on them this morning. And we pray that you continue to help them raise funds, especially as they try to meet targets for this year, to continue their training up in America. And we pray that John continues in his studies. We also think of the AIDS ministry here. We thank you for Unati, who has such great concern for those involved, not just for their physical health, but also takes care and concern for their individual spiritual health. And so we thank you for her. We thank you for Pastor Sia and all he does and, and how he, he's faithfully taking the parcels to their homes at this time. We think of Bible Way and for Livingstones. We know that it's very difficult at the moment with COVID and in many ways ministry is being halted. But I pray you continue to help them, continue to support them, and may they still be able to continue to serve you and take the gospel to people's life, into people. And we now, Father, pray that your will be done in our country. We, we pray for the, the South African National Christian Forum as they present this, their case this week in the courts about challenging the decision about closing churches. I pray you would give them wisdom and to lay down their argument clearly. And we pray that the government would hear them and to see uh, what they have to say. Father, we now pray that you would give us our daily bread. We know many are struggling, and we would pray that you continue to open your hands, you continue to provide for, for all of our needs, especially for the needy. And we also pray that we would be so kind for those who have in abundance. Pray that you would open our hearts to share with those in need. We also, Father, pray that you forgive us our sins, as we also forgive the sins of forgive the sins of those who sin against us. We know that your word tells us to have no other gods before you and to have no idols. But we confess there is much in this world that we love, many created things that conflict with our desires for you. Things that you have created, things that you have given to us out of your goodness, but we turn many good things into idols. And so we think of things such as spouses and children and sport and delicious food and money and cell phones and so much more. We confess that we worship idols and other gods. But we pray that you would forgive us. We would, that you would forgive us, O oh, oh Father, the one who is perfect and loving and who is the creator who has created all these things. May we give you praise and not created things. We pray, Father, that you would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We recognize that we are so frail, we often fall into temptation. 
We are all like sheep that have gone astray. But please, O oh Father, our shepherd, lead us in the paths of righteousness. You who are faithful, will you strengthen and protect us from the evil one. And for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to you, everyone. We so wish that we could be together in this building this morning, but for providential reasons, we cannot. But even so, I encourage you all to love one another. Don't forget each other. Phone each other. Send a WhatsApp. Encourage one another in the faith. This is a difficult time for the church, as you well know. But we trust the Lord. We keep praying that He will restore us in His good time. But in the meantime, we must have patience and suffer with endurance. The Lord knows. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, our lights went on. Uh, at some point, we are having a power failure, and the power has just come back on. So uh, we're just setting up the PowerPoint at the moment. All right. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. Great, so let me address the boys and girls. If there are any boys and girls with their moms and dads, come a little bit closer to the screen. I want to share something with you about God's holiness. God's holiness. I wonder who can tell me what that is. That is a picture of the sun. Now, it doesn't look like that to us when we're standing here on earth, but that's what the sun looks like. Has your mom or dad ever told you not to look at the sun? I hope so. You must not look at the sun because if you look too long, it can actually damage your eyes. The sun is really, really bright. It's a big burning ball of fire. So the sun is really bright. And I want to tell you something interesting about the sun. The sun is really, really far away from earth. This is kind of like how far it is, but it's much, much, much further. Scientists tell us that if you had to get in a car and drive to the sun at the speed limit in South Africa, which is 120 kilometers an hour, and I realize some of your parents could get there faster, but if you had to drive 120 kilometers an hour all the way to the sun on a big road, it would take you over 160 years to get there. That's really, really far away. But that's actually a good thing, boys and girls. Do you know why? If we were a little bit closer to the sun, do you know what would happen to the earth? Do you know what would happen to us? Well, something like that would happen to us. That is a burnt marshmallow. You know how you cook marshmallows on the fire? If you take it too close, it's going to start burning. Yes, that's what would happen to the whole world if we got too close to the sun. And if we got too far away from the sun, guess what would happen? We'd all freeze. It would be too cold for us. So we're just in the right place so that we can have nice sunshiny days on the beach. Now, boys and girls, the sun is a bit like God's holiness, okay? God's holiness is really good. It's like the beautiful sunshine on the beach. The whole world couldn't live without sunshine. You and I couldn't live without sunshine. No plants or animals could live without sunshine. So holiness is really good. But if you get too close to God, guess what, what, guess what would happen? You would burn up. Okay, because God is so pure. He's so great. It's kind of like getting too close to the sun. You turn into a marshmallow. The Bible tells us this in Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to look at this carefully with me. 
The writer to the Hebrews says, Let us be thankful and worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire, like the sun. If you get too close to God, you burn up. Now, he also tells us what we need to survive getting close to God. He says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Okay, without holiness, we would all just burn up in God's presence. So we need holiness to be close to God. Now, here's a hard question. Where do we get holiness? Any ideas? Does the Bible tell you that you need to be holy by doing good things all the time to make God happy? Oh, yes, but here's the problem. We can't do that. We can't be holy enough. The Bible says we all sin. We all do naughty things. And so if we had to get close to God, we would burn up in that consuming fire, in that big fire. But here's the wonderful thing. Here's the good news, boys and girls. We get our holiness from Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews says, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus is the only way that you can get really close to God without burning up. Jesus is the only way we can get holy because he died on the cross for our sins. I hope that you remember that. When you enjoy the sunshine, God is holy, God is good, and we can enjoy His holiness like we enjoy the sunshine on the beach. But it's also dangerous, and we need Jesus to get close to God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for all the little ones that are a part of this church. Thank You, God, for their parents. Thank You for what You are doing in their lives through their parents and we pray that their parents would lead them to Christ and we pray for these young ones that they would know that you are holy and that you are good from a very young age we also pray that they would receive that holiness that only Jesus can give which helps us to get close to you without burning up and we pray this all in Jesus name amen now let's turn to Scripture. We're going to go to Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read the first seven verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that now you would have our full attention. God, would you purify our hearts? Would you help us to hear with faith and believe? May you give us faith so that when we see what Isaiah sees through the scriptures, we know that that is the true and the living God that we are seeing, the one that we worship and the one who saves. Lord, be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We are told in verse 1 of this chapter that it was the year that the king Uzziah died. This was a time of national mourning. It was a great tragedy. And it was a time of great uncertainty in Israel. In 2 Chronicles 26, we're told quite a lot about this king Uzziah who died. We're told that he was a good king. We hear these golden words spoken about him. And I quote, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. He was a good king. R.C. Sproul says that he belongs in the top five best kings that Israel had ever had. King Uzziah, in this chapter, 2 Chronicles 26, is described as a brilliant king and an innovator. We're told that the state of Judah prospered under his rule. He led the defeat of the Philistines and the Arabs. He built fortified towers and strengthened the armies of Judah. He commissioned skilled men to create devices that could shoot arrows and large stones at enemies from the city walls. And he also encouraged agriculture. The Bible says that he was a man who loved the soil. He was also a famous man. The Bible tells us that his fame spread all over the ancient world as far as the borders of Egypt. So that's quite a glowing report. But... He was an imperfect man. As they say, the best of men are men at best. He had his flaws, and he even came under serious judgment toward the end of his life, which we will look at a little bit later. But for all accounts, he was a really good king. He was the kind of leader that South Africa needs. We need righteous leaders, don't we? We need men and women who fear God, under which we will prosper. And we want ourselves and our families to have a good life in this land, don't we? We want our children to have opportunities and freedom and to feel safe. We don't want them to feel like they have to look abroad to have a good life. We want young and old to prosper. We want all of us to feel safe together in a free and happy society. So when there are good kings like Uzziah around, we're happy. But what happens when such a good king dies? Well, you can imagine how they felt. It made them feel very uncertain. Where are we going to find another good leader like Uzziah? We know the history. And is his son going to live up to expectations? And we ask ourselves similar questions today, don't we? Where are we going to find good leaders? But in such a turbulent time... God gives Isaiah a vision which answers all of these questions. And this morning we're going to peek behind the heavenly curtain once more and see what Isaiah saw that day. And I want to show you four things that Isaiah saw and that he experienced. The first has to do with the sovereign. The second has to do with the sovereign sanctity. The third thing has to do with our sin. And the fourth thing has to do with our salvation. So let's look at the first one. The sovereign. It says there in the, verse, the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. When the earthly king dies, Isaiah is given the privilege of seeing the king who does not die. The eternal king. And not just any king. He sees the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The one who is above all other. The one who is the true king on which every other earthly authority is based. He sees the one that Paul describes in Colossians, which we read earlier. He sees the one by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created 
through him and for him. That is the one that Isaiah sees. He's also described by King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. He says his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Isaiah sees the one who literally steers the course of time and history. The one whose will is supreme. The one to whom every creature must bow and give account. This is the one who upholds everything. If he ceased to uphold the creation for one moment, we would disappear. This is the God of the universe. This is the one of whom Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. This is the sovereign king of the universe. Which is why Spurgeon says, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit as well as the sun in the heavens. That the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars in their courses. The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is as much fixed as the march of the devastating pestilence. The fall of the autumn leaves from a poplar is as fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. Why? Because our God is sovereign. He is the commander in chief of the universe. He is the one who has the laws of nature in his hand, who rules over all things and all events and all people. So what does this mean to us, brothers and sisters? What does this mean to us when we are looking for good leadership in this land or in our lives? Well, here's the answer. The direction that you so desperately yearn for in your life. And the order that you so desperately need to organize your chaotic life is not to be found in this world. The order comes from above. You need to look up. We need to look up. We need to see what Isaiah saw. And we need to submit ourselves to this king. We need to stop looking down. And you might say to me, you know, your life is, is just falling apart and your family is suffering and the economy is going to pieces and everything's just falling apart. Well, do you know why? It's because we don't look up. It's because we do not come under the authority of this one who is high and lifted up. If only we did, if only we did and things would come right. We need to look up. And our government needs to look up. And our schools and universities and families need to look up to the one who is high and lifted up. So what is this all-powerful one like in his character? I mean, we're living in a day and age where people are becoming more and more uncomfortable with power, aren't we? I mean, look at the scandal of the government of South Africa. Look at the scandals of world governments. Look at the history of power in this world. It's not a very bright and happy picture, is it? So people are becoming increasingly skeptical. They say things like, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. People are becoming increasingly hostile toward authority. And you see the skepticism all over, even in countries like the so-called leader of the free world, the United States of America. Look at the circus going on there at the moment. But what is this leader like? Is this one who is high and lifted up any different from the ones that we see in this world? And the answer is absolutely yes. He is so different that we can hardly understand it. And this brings us to our next point here. His sanctity. 
It says in verse 2 and onward, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covers his face. With two he covers his feet. And with two he flies. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. I want you to notice the posture of these angels around this being, this God. Their entire posture is designed to glorify God. Their entire posture is designed to hide themselves and magnify this Holy One. We're told that they cover their faces. Now, as I explained to the boys and girls earlier, these angels look at God much like we try and look at the sun. It's unbearable. And so they have to hide their faces so as not to be blinded or destroyed by the very sight of God. They're not like people in our day and age who, when we find someone great, we want to take a selfie with them, right? You find some celebrity and you try to get shoulder to shoulder and then you put on a funny grin and that's your selfie. These angels are not interested in selfies with God. They would be utterly ashamed to do that because He is so great and so holy. They cover their feet, we're told. And some theologians have explained the reason why they do that is because of that association with earth. Their feet associate themselves with earth. And earth is so broken and so sinful and so unholy. So with a sense of shame, they cover their feet and, and then with two wings, they fly. Which means that they are ever ready to do exactly what God commands. And we will see just a moment later, one of them flies over to Isaiah. What do they cry to one another? They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When you and I spend a lot of time with someone up close and personal, we really get to know them. I mean like marriage. You, you really get to know each other. When you spend so much time with one another, when you sleep in the same bed. With that comes the ability to describe that person like no one else can. You really know them. And so you can really accurately describe them. Now what do they say about the Lord? these angels what would you expect them to say would you expect them to say he is love 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 he is grace 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 he is gentle 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 now what do they say what is the one thing that they want to say above every other thing that he is holy he is holy. He is holy. This is a Hebrew way of emphasizing something. Sometimes Hebrews will say it twice to emphasize something. Sometimes they'll say it three times. And we're told by theologians that this is the only place in the Bible where threefold repetition is used. Holy, holy, holy. It is the greatest possible degree of holiness that these angels can imagine. It is their way of emphasizing the point. And we have our own ways of emphasizing something. You know, you'll put it in bold or italics. Or if you're speaking, you'll raise your voice. Well, these angels do it in two ways. They use language, but they also use the tone of their voice. We're told in verse 4, And the foundations shook at the thresholds because of those who were calling out. And the whole house was filled with smoke. So they really want you to understand it. They really want you to know that this being is so holy that you can't understand it. He is more holy than anything else. But what do they mean? Well, when you and I use the term holy, when we're describing someone, we mean that that person is morally pure, right? That's a very holy person, meaning he probably doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he goes to church, he reads his Bible. He's a very nice guy. He loves the Lord. 
very holy. And in a sense, that's true about holiness. It is moral purity. It is total purity in the sense of God. He cannot endure sin. He is totally pure in all that he thinks, all that he wills, all that he feels. He has never sinned. He will never sin. If he could sin, it would just totally destroy God. It it, it cannot happen. It's an impossibility. God hates sin. And he is totally pure. But that's not the only meaning of holiness. John Piper helps us to understand the bigger picture here. He says, the root meaning of holy is to cut off or to separate. A holy thing is cut off from and separated from common, we would say, secular use. Earthly things and persons are holy as they are distinct from the world and devoted to God. So the Bible speaks of holy ground, holy assemblies, holy Sabbaths, holy nation. Holy garments, a holy city, holy promises, holy men and women, holy scriptures, holy hands, a holy kiss. Almost anything can be holy if it, if it is separated from its common use and devoted totally to God. But then what about God's holiness? How is he separate? I mean, we, we use it to describe things that are separated from from their common use to God, but what about God? And and Piper goes on to say, what then is His holiness? Well, His holiness is His utterly unique, divine, transcendent, pure essence, which is His uniqueness. Sorry, which in His uniqueness has infinite value. It determines all that He is and does and is determined by no one. His holiness is what he is as God, which no one else is or ever will be. He is totally unique. There is no one like him. And because of that, he deserves to be the very center of our attention. He deserves to be the most central, the most treasured, the most feared, the most adored being in our lives. So holiness is his uniqueness and it's his moral purity. And these two go together so beautifully. As Stephen Charnock, the great Puritan writer, put it so long ago, he said, if every attribute of the deity were a distinct member, holiness would be the soul to animate them. Without his holiness, his patience would be an indulgence to sin. His mercy, a fondness. His wrath, a madness. His power, a tyranny. His wisdom, an unworthy subtlety. Holiness gives beauty to them all. Now friends, this is something that we as sinful human beings resist, don't we? That's the problem with us. We resist the holiness of God. Why? Well, because it threatens us, doesn't it? It reveals who we are as sinners and it makes us feel bad about ourselves, which doesn't encourage us to approach Him. We're okay with Him being loving. We're okay with Him being kind. We're we're okay with Him being gentle and generous. But very seldom do we speak of God as holy. 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 We suppress it. We forget it. And... We get on with our lives as though He weren't holy. Or as though He didn't even exist. That is our problem. That is our sinfulness. And this is what happened to King Uzziah. I want to illustrate this by turning to 2 Chronicles 26 from verse 16 onward. We read this about Uzziah. But after... Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. 
Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah the chief priest and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is what happens to us when we forget the holiness of God. When we start to play God like Uzziah did. You see, he wanted to approach God on his own terms. He did not treat the Lord as holy, as absolutely pure and absolutely magnificent and unique. He forgot, or he didn't want to know, that God has the right to tell us how we should approach Him. He barged into the temple and he started doing things which he was not allowed to do according to the holy law of God. And he died alone and a leper. That is a picture of the judgment which we deserve for not treating God as holy. And I wonder, is this a picture of your life? Are you playing God? Are you treating God as some sort of equal? Do you think that you can honestly manipulate Him and tell Him what He should do for you? Or do you fall flat on your face and worship? We should be like the angels, like the seraphim rather. Who have this magnificent posture, always ready to worship God, always ready to serve Him, and ashamed to look at Him. We should have their heart, and not the heart of King Uzziah in his later life. And I wonder, could you sing with them that song of heaven, holy, holy, holy? Could you sing it with all of your heart? Could you sing it full of the fear of God? Why are you singing another tune about God that is not right about Him? What effect does this all have on prophet Isaiah being in the throne room of heaven? This brings us to our third main point. Our sin. This whole experience convicts Isaiah of his sinfulness. Look at his reaction in verse 5. And I said, woe is me. For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's amazing. His reaction is very similar to Simon Peter's reaction much later on when Simon Peter realized who Jesus was. Remember how Simon said, or he fell at Jesus knees and he said depart from me for i'm a sinful man O lord you would expect that of simon but you wouldn't quite expect that from isaiah you wouldn't expect isaiah to say i am lost and i have unclean lips why because he was a prophet of god one of the greatest prophets in the old testament you might think this is hypersensitive i mean this is just blowing things out of proportion Isaiah, you're not lost. Isaiah, you don't have unclean lips. And besides, there are worse things than having unclean lips. I mean, who doesn't slip out a swear word every now and then? Surely there are worse things like adultery or murder or theft or idolatry. Don't worry about the small things. Unclean lips. What's that? But friends, it's the other way around. When you get close into the presence of God... It reveals everything about you. And you become extremely embarrassed over the smallest thing. The smallest little thought. The smallest little action. The smallest little word that is wrong. You would be utterly ashamed of yourself. And that is how it should be. The closer you get to God, the more you see of your sin. Of your unrighteousness. And that's how it should be. But we're living in a world which denies the sinfulness of human nature. We're living in a world which would look at Isaiah and say, Calm down, Isaiah. It's not so bad. You're actually a good guy. 
There's this popular myth going around that people are not so bad. I was watching this video on a channel called The Big Think on YouTube. It's a secular channel and they get a lot of views. They're very popular. And there was one recently about human nature being evil. And this gentleman, Rutger Bregman, who wrote a book on human nature, said this. There's a really old theory in Western culture that scientists call veneer theory. The idea is that our civilization is only a thin veneer, only a thin layer, and that below that veneer, sort of a real raw human nature resides. And that when something small happens, or big, like a pandemic, humans reveal who they really are. That deep down, we're just selfish. He goes on to say, the problem with this idea is that it's simply wrong. So in the last 20 to 25 years, we've seen so much evidence accumulating from anthropology and from archaeology and from biology and from psychology and sociology with one main message, which is that basically deep down, most people are pretty decent and that this capacity for cooperation is actually our true superpower. Friends, as I was reading this, I thought, can you be more deluded? about human nature? Can you be more ignorant? Can you be more deluded and dishonest about human nature? Does this man know who he is before God? Obviously he doesn't. If he had to just have a moment in God's presence, all of this nonsense would blow away like chaff before the wind. He would be ashamed of saying this. Why does he say this? Well, it's because he has such a low view of the holiness of God. This is not what God sees in us at all. He doesn't see a superpower among us of cooperation and love. I mean, just look at the history books. Look at the world in which we live in. So I wonder about you. Have you come under this conviction of sin? If you haven't, then you haven't even started The first step on the Christian journey. You don't know who God is. You don't know His holiness. You have no clue who you really are. Really and actually and truly. But if you have come under this conviction of sin, I'd like to remind you that this is not just a once-off event. This is not something that happens way back When you were a pagan and then you were convicted of your sin and now you're fine. We're talking about Isaiah here who walked with the Lord, who was a prophet of God, who saw more than what you would ever see of God in this lifetime. And he says this about himself. He says, whoa, I'm lost. I'm undone. I'm falling apart at the seams. If it's true of him, then it's true of all of us. You might wonder, well, you know, I I don't think I've sinned in a while. Surely I'm not as bad. Well, brother or sister, if only you knew what you should be doing for God and your fellow man, then you would fall flat on your face in shame. If only you knew the things that you were leaving out because of your selfishness and your convenience And your laziness, you would be utterly ashamed. And that's not even to mention the things that you do which you shouldn't be doing. We are no better. If we had to come into the presence of the Lord right now, we would all face the same thing. We would all experience the same if we were truly honest. But does the Lord leave him alone in this state? Does he just leave him cowering, ashamed? This brings us to our last point, our salvation. It says in verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. The altar was a place where offerings were, were placed. It looked something like this, if you can see that. It was a place where innumerable burnt offerings were made to God, where the carcasses of animals were thrown onto the coals and burned up. It's a picture of two things. It's a symbolic picture of two things. The first is of God's wrath. The second is of God's grace. What about wrath? 
or wrath is like the fire on the altar. It is the consuming anger of God against sin. Our God is furious with sin and with sinners. His instinct, his holy instinct is to lash out and to destroy and to consume like fire. So it is a picture of his wrath, but it is also a picture of his grace. Why? Because the sinners are not placed on the altar. Substitutes are placed on the altar so that the sinner may be forgiven and justified. And at the same time, God's wrath is satisfied. So it is a picture of wrath and of grace. It is from a similar altar that one of the angels takes one of the coals to Isaiah's lips. And he says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Atonement is a beautiful word. It, it means to cover over. It means to blot out. When it's referring to a debt, it refers to the debt being fully paid off. It is totally finished. Here is the grace that Isaiah experiences. Instead of him roasting on the altar, only his lips are touched. And instead of Isaiah's unclean lips contaminating the holy coal from the holy altar, the holy coal makes him clean. It is a symbol of what theologians have called imputation. Where one thing is attributed to another. In this case, it is the cleanness of the coal cleansing Isaiah, atoning for his sins. But you might ask, does this mean that a burning coal can take away sins? And the answer is obviously no. This whole scene is symbolic. When you read the rest of the scripture and you compare scripture with scripture, you realize that a coal cannot take away sins. Nor could any of the burnt offerings of the animals that were slaughtered in the Old Covenant. We read about that in Hebrews. The author of Hebrews tells us that we know that animals can't take away sins because they keep on offering them again. It shows that the problem hasn't been solved. So this whole scene is symbolic, just like all of the ceremonies of the Old Covenant. It's pointing to something greater. You might ask, what is that greater thing that this is pointing towards? Well, Isaiah tells you. He is the same prophet who wrote down Isaiah chapter 53. And that wonderful chapter has this in it. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. It is so clear that God's final plan to deal with the sins of his people would come through the Messiah, and we know his name is Jesus of Nazareth. So you might ask, well, how was Isaiah forgiven? Was it a real forgiveness? And the answer is yes, Isaiah was really forgiven. He really had atonement for his sins, but it was taken on credit. Just like we use our credit cards and we pay the debt later on. So the saints of the Old Testament's forgiveness was taken on credit. Why? Because one day the debt will, would be settled by Christ on Calvary. Isaiah knew that. He prophesied that the Messiah would do that for him. It's just as Paul says 
Later on in Romans 3, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so this is the gospel that Isaiah knew and experienced even in the throne room of heaven so long ago. It's as Timothy Keller puts it so well. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever did hope. So let me ask you this morning, do you know this Savior? Is this salvation yours? Do you believe that there is a forgiveness for your sins just as there was for Isaiah? Do you know that you are a sinner before this holy sovereign? Do you know that He lives and He rules the universe and one day you must give account to Him? Do you know that you can't stand before Him on your own two feet without His grace and without His salvation? So we find in these few beautiful verses almost the whole biblical worldview that there is a God in heaven who is holy, that we are sinners, but there is salvation for us. Is that your worldview? And does that give you hope in the turbulence of your life when we can hardly find a good leader, when our lives seem to be falling apart and the economy is so unstable and there's a pandemic? Are you looking up to this sovereign? Are you under his authority? Do you love his law? Do you love what he loves and hate what he hates? Do you want him to give you order and structure in your life? He is the only one who can satisfy that yearning in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, we pray with great thanksgiving for this vision of heaven. And we pray that this would not just be a vision that Isaiah had long ago. We pray that this would be our vision of Christ. Thank you for the one who was seated on the throne, who is gracious and loving, who forgives. We pray that he would be ours and we would be his. Give us hope in this turbulent world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Grace to you all. Bless you.